Hello and welcome to Barn Blog. And today I'm with Matt Cabagrodi, and we are talking about uh, the financial crisis, Marxism, the last financial crisis, uh, treasuries, uh, maybe even theories of economic uh, progression. Well, we'll see. But uh, a lot of stuff is going to come up because um, I'm going to foreground this as we're going to go into specifics about what has changed um, in the last week. Uh, I had a moderate uh, concern level on Saturday when I recorded my last special edition on uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Since then, there have been at least three more banks. Credit Suisse, uh, I mean, Credit Suisse has has uh, been structurally taken over by the by the Swiss banking authorities. Uh, there are demands for liquidity and calls for uh, the kinds of provisions given to uh, the four banks that went under this week by the Fed um, to every mid-sized to small bank um, now. Uh, as I saw on Friday. Um, but this also raises questions about the return to Marxism because the entire general narrative, if you open up a book from David Harvey to, to Michael Heinrich, you're going to see the first question is like 2007 made Marxism relevant again. Um, and so we, we're going to try to parse both those questions at once today. Um, what is the current situation in regards to banking? Why does this seem to be a systemic crisis? One of my friends actually said this might be the first sovereign debt crisis in the United States. Um, now, that that's going to be interesting because that cuts against almost every narrative on the left about what has been going on. But we'll, we'll see how this goes. So, Matt, um, let's just let's let's uh, start with the immediate. Um, what have you noticed that's happened this week that we should be concerned about as far as like the the seeming <laughs> uh, somehow treasuries being valuable has made them toxic assets? So, oh man, um, <laughs> how fast shit got real is what I noticed. I don't know about you, buddy, but wow. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> Uh, w when I talked to Nico Villarreal, he's like, well, right now it looks like it's going to be serious, but it's mostly limited to stuff in California tied into the tech industry. And I'm like, I don't know. It, I, 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 I take your point. That is what it looks like right now. But it always feels like when something like this breaks, that there's way more fracture points downstream that we don't see. And immediately I'm like, shit's popping off in Europe? In Europe? Why Europe? And then you're like, oh, well, capitalization regulations are actually really opaque in both the EU and in Switzerland. Okay. Uh, Swiss, the, the Central Bank of, of Switzerland has been hemorrhaging money. Um, so yeah, do you, do you, uh, I, I, I see you're, you're on Twitter. Do you follow Michael Burry on Twitter? No, I don't, but I might. No, right he, now. he, <laughs> You know, of course, he, he famously deletes his tweets like not long after he sends them out. Uh, something to do with like you know, his quirky uh, feelings of like not letting like um, all of the bots like use his tweets for like their own exploitative purposes or whatever. But like there's an archive of his tweets like somebody compiles every time he puts something out and somebody will retweet it under like uh uh, the name um, like Michael Burry archive. And I was looking at it the other day, um, you know, just kind of, you know, I periodically check with him because um, I, I admire the guy, you know, he's um, if nothing else, one of the few people who has successfully bet against American capitalism and won. Uh, but, you know, just because the, the guy had uh, a great foresight and um, he, he's always been very humble about that and he's, uh, he's never rubbed it in people's faces. Uh, in fact, um, he, he's always tried to use whatever platform he's seen from, you know, betting against the subprime uh, mortgage crisis to, to try and, and advocate 
for uh, you know some semblance of you know responsibility and, and um, you know to, to push back against the the kind of psychology that is contributed to um, you know the the circumstances that that led to the uh, the the 2008 crisis. But anyway, I was I was looking at his Twitter uh, to see what he had to say about all this, and he said something. Um, he said something to the effect of. Um, uh, this should resolve itself quickly. I see no real danger here. <laughs> and I was like, is this guy being sarcastic or what? And then I was like, this, this guy has to be sarcastic because of course he's been railing against like the asset bubble and, and everything, um, and, and you know, the, the ultra loose, um, monetary policy on behalf of the fed and other central banks and everything and how grossly irresponsible it's all been for like, a, a solid three or four years now, like even well before COVID. And so Michael Burry, uh, he, he let out a, a little, a little sarcastic quip about it the other day. And that speaks directly to your point is that these things rarely resolve themselves quickly. No, and what I think is is telling. I was reading Michael Hudson, who I often read because I want to see how many more times he's going to predict the dollar is going to crash into nothing in a month. Um, but he actually did make some interesting observations about this situation, and uh, he explained it uh, pretty well um, on a show with with Ben Norton, um, and. Uh, he made a point that I thought was pretty interesting. He's like, look, last time we had a toxic asset bubble and it was systemic because the, because it was an asset that affects, you know, everybody, but uh, it wasn't somehow the treasury note collapsing banks. That's a more systemic problem, not a less systemic one. And and that cuts against what I'm hearing in mainstream reporting right now. Who people seem to think that this is that this is a not that big a deal. And I'm like, look, if if every small bank is going to have trouble with keeping deposits in because because of treasuries at four percent, because they can't afford to compete with that, um, in savings account, and, and who saves anyway? But even even with that, in savings account interest. What do you think that's going to mean? Like that just says something about the fragility of the banking system in a fundamental way. There's just there's so much fucked up stuff here. Like, uh, all right, so we're jumping a bit ahead here, but just to to, to piggyback on what you said, when when they did, uh, you know, the resolution at least to the 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 Silicon Valley Bank uh, uh, collapse was that you know over the weekend, uh, you know, the the forces. That B got together, and uh, on uh, that that Sunday evening, then they announced that the, um, uh, the 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 FDIC, which is like the main like regulatory institution, like uh, banking regulatory institution of the United States, uh, the, said that they were going to step in and provide liquidity. Uh, you know, essentially that they were going to ensure. Um, investor deposits uh, both insured and non-insured uh, deposits and uh, then they after that they they uh, went so far to say you know that if this um, continues to happen that you know we're prepared to 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 deal with it but really what that does then if they're if they're saying that either they're saying that and they don't really mean it or they're saying that and they mean it. And what they're doing is they're opening themselves up to essentially having to, to ensure all, all of the, the insured and non-insured deposits of like all of these regional banks and all of like these small banks, if like this continues to happen. And I suspect um, that, that, that that's not actually true, but there's so much to unpack here. Um, if if I may, um, I want I want to force I want to just do a broad overview of like the timeline of everything associated with this. Go ahead. Uh, but but before but before we do that, if you don't mind, 
I want to see if whether it's possible for me to screen share. I don't know if I try and screen share a YouTube video that I have pulled up, whether or not it's going to uh, play the video or if it's going to defer to my microphone. So let's try first. And if not, then I'll just read the, the quote from it. Sure. Uh, okay, let's see if I can figure it out here. It's a bit. All right. There we go. I've added it to stream. Yep. So here's the clip. Tell me if you can't hear audio. I can't hear audio. No audio? Okay. No audio. Yeah, then I'll just uh, I'll just read it here. Um, so this is this is from a show, um, Breaking Points, which I guess is a bit of like you know like a a, a populist kind of like you know, an, anti like authority you know uh, show on YouTube. I don't know if it's a partisan bent. I don't watch it enough to know. I just saw this particular clip and. Uh, and, and felt that it, it spoke to a very important point that was useful to preface our whole conversation, which is that there's a really ugly trend of like uh, accepting the pronouncements of the Federal Reserve as if they're handed down from on high. And in this view, uh, Fed policymakers are just quants analyzing data and calling balls and strikes. And this is absurd. Uh, monetary policy is just as subject to politics, ideological capture, and just human beings making big mistakes as any other body. They should be questioned. They should be questioned vigorously. And the public should feel empowered to have an opinion on Fed policy since few things more directly impact their lives. The language around Fed policy has been made intentionally opaque and confusing in order to keep that rogue element, the people, from feeling like they understand enough in order to have a say. Yeah, I think that's actually fundamentally true. And what I find hilarious about it in some ways, I've been pointing out that the Fed's justification for its particular kinds of meddling and in interest rates and of monetarism has shifted fundamentally. Uh, but its actions are the same. So the Volcker shocks logic was okay, if we raise interest rates, it'll pull money out of liquidity in the economy. People will put them into banks. Banks will be tighter on lending because the interest rates are higher uh, so that they have to pay out more, but they'll reward savings more through higher savings account interest rates. Um, and thus, people will be saving more. People will be making more. They have to make more explicit, productive, and safer investments and as this gets re-safe it'll get looser over time and we can lower the interest rates back down and inflation will, will fall that's the theory that was justified the uh, volcker shock was justified on um that didn't happen all right like yes eventually it did uh there was a uh, decline in inflation we don't really entirely know what caused it because it was several years after the volcker shock ended when uh, inflation really, really stopped significantly. So inflation really stopped. Well, they, they didn't even, mm -hmm. they, they didn't even keep interest rates elevated. Like, like uh, Volcker, like recanted not long after. Yeah, that. very quickly. Like they, they recant around 83, you know, and then, and I also, they raised it much slower than we're raising it now. That's one thing people are not paying attention to. While we are not up to Volcker levels of, of interest rates the the speed in which the interest rate has increased is much faster than it did during the quote volcker shock um so but they, they basically back down inflation goes down and well inflation goes down and by that we don't mean things got cheaper we just mean they quit you know it goes down to about three to two or three percent around 1986 right they, they pull back on the volkers on volcker around the savings and loans and loans crisis. Like, I think people forget that. Um, so there's three years between when the savings and loans crisis hits and like actually inflation goes down and that uh, MMTers uh, will say that that's proof that it didn't work. 
I, 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 I'm sympathetic to their point there, but I think it's like, well, it's proof that we don't know what the hell is going on. It's really what it's <laughs> proof of. Um, so, so then they, you know, we've had, there was an attempt to raise interest rates again to slow the economy down. There's a slight tick up in inflation around 2006. Um, and some people, there, there are some, I don't think this is a common view even amongst modern monetary theorists, but there's some people who think that that was actually uh, a causal thing for what broke in, um, in 2007, as much as a subprime market. I tend to think that's probably not true, um, but whatever, it, it is concurrent with it. Um, and now we're having it, but their theory for what they need to do is, is different. Instead of saying that they're encouraging savings, they're saying that, well, employee cost is, is a problem, even though. By yeah, that's own, wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> it's absolutely wrong. Right. But they keep saying it. That, that's that's actually what the, uh, the 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 video that I wanted to show you that I read that quote from what she mm -hmm. was riffing off of is, is some some guy who 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 went on on um, CNBC and, and erroneously claimed that, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Even conservative, whatever that means when we're talking about economists, we're going to put conservative and liberal and progressive all this with asterisks on it for for today, because I don't think it's really helpful. But they would they were saying that like even a year ago that when when uh, wages were were going up faster than they are now, uh, that, that was the most it could explain was one percent of inflation. That that's that, that it really doesn't explain the inflation yet. What Jay Powell keeps on saying is that we need to increase unemployment, you know, basically. And in fact, it's it was blatantly reported before we even got to the Silicon Valley thing. I was reading a stuff, one of the trade, one of the trade papers I read, and they're like, well, we're expected to see a downturn today because the employment stats are too good. And I'm like, that's nuts. Like for one, before we really get into it, um, we, we are somehow supposed to have an industrial policy where we reshore a bunch of stuff and start kicking up a, a trend of remanufacturing things in the United States with a declining population. Um, and then you want to have high, high unemployment on top of that. I don't know. I mean, just like simply based upon um, demographic trends. And I mean, look, when, when they talk about this stuff, it kills me every time because like, I feel like they're trying to gaslight me. Like, who are you going to believe, like me or your lying eyes? Because, like, you know, I'm by no means expert on this stuff, Derek. You know, I'll be the first to admit that what I am is I'm just a self-taught individual who enjoys talking about things um, that uh, I like. Um, but when they try and tell me that they are going to like uh, raise interest rates in order to, to reduce demand by increasing unemployment, but in such a way that is not going to cause a recession and that, like a soft landing is still possible. Like I, I, I can't fucking believe it, man. <laughs> they, I really can't. Like, I just feel like, I feel like we live in some kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I just, it feels objectively insane to me that you would even yes. posit that. Like it's just like, okay, we have declining population, we have an aging population, we have we we people left to work first during COVID and mass. We're amount. missing two million people from <laughs> the, the from the, uh, the the workforce that were they, and they and by the way, economists cannot find these people. They don't know where where they are. I mean, there's. Uh, there's uh, some conjecture that like a lot of them are from like uh, age 18 to 25 uh, people who I don't know what they're doing. Are they just playing video games or what? But the point is, is that they were there and they're not now. And 2 million people in the context of the American workforce matters in a tight labor market. You know, right. and just like all of this stuff is just completely implausible to me. I don't know. Maybe there's there's got to be something that I, either I'm missing something huge or like these people are completely disingenuous is is what I'm getting at. Well, I think when we talked about this last time, we came to the conclusion that they, they don't want to admit they don't know what to do and they only have one lever to pull. And that lever right now is is they have to come up with a new justification for pulling it because they know that eventually it's going to lead to 
to uh, higher unemployment, except that given this situation and the declining rate of, you know, declining rate of the workforce. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't know what happened to those 2 million people. We know what happened to a lot of it from baby boomer attrition. I mean, that we do have that, but that's only probably one fourth of that. And uh, we know they're not dead. Um, although there, you know, we did lose a lot of people in the last three years, but so we have that. Um, it, it, it's also worrying because it's at this moment where everyone's talking about decoupling, which is going to require massive investment in actual labor and like labor, labor, not just like, you know, computers and robots doing shit. You chat GPT cannot build a factory. So, so it's like, and yes, you can have robots help with that, but, but I mean, it's, it's just, to me, that's kind of, um, nutty. Um, you know, even the massive tech layoffs have not led to to like an an increase in general unemployment. This is so like, like, so, so just a, just a bit of background here, I guess, for your viewers who didn't like, um listen to like our last episode so um derek and i know each other uh i i i helped doug lane for a while with with zero books but uh derek is also um a a former plat member from back in the day uh i am am still i've not been active for you know probably three years now but you know i i still am a member our tenure never overlapped uh, but you know, we we at least kind of had that background in common. But also, um, both Derek and I are trade unionists. Of course, Derek is on uh, the the, uh, uh, the the teacher side. So I guess you work for the state. Um, yeah. I'm I'm in the private sector. I work for UPS, and uh, UPS has started to lay off, but they have only done it like as uh, a measure of threat because like our con- our our contract negotiations coming up in um the summer and so they're they're doing it like even though like it's they're not doing it out of like any real economically justifiable reasons they're doing it literally just like to scare people um uh, as, as a scare tactic and we see it because like the people that they do can uh continue to you know um to, to keep working you know they heap like excessive overtime on so like we know the work's there uh, but no you're right it has not led to the kind of layoffs uh that would have been expected in um the the rest of the economy um and yeah i I'm at a loss for words uh, about a lot of this stuff sometimes. So like the labor, the, 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 the economic data that keeps coming through, um, it's too strong. It keeps being too strong. And uh, so we're getting, again, a, a bit ahead of ourselves here, but just to forecast, you know, where this conversation is going, it's then the question uh, for the Federal Reserve um, in, in terms of like forward guidance on its policy then is, you know, do we continue to stay the course or do we do something different, uh, you know, with our, our limited uh, tool set. And so, yeah, recently the conjecture has been if the data keeps coming in and it's too strong and it's not having the effect on, uh, uh, on employment, which, you know, uh, affects aggregate demand that in fact, that what they may have to do is only, uh, raise rates, uh, um, uh, more than was expected, but also to keep them higher for longer. And that was kind of the baseline expectation. Uh, the, the, the market actually has had a pretty strong rally since the beginning of the year off, off of ne- its near lows. It started in December, but you know, around its lows, I, I don't know exactly how much, I think maybe like six or 7%, maybe a little more, but, um, then here recently, um, 
you know, it has started to turn back uh, down again. And, and you know, the the whole reason for that is that when the data came through, then people started saying, oh, shit. <laughs> like, you know, this has started to work. But the, the point is, is that is it's not continuing to work in the manner in which we need it to get done what we need done in a timely manner. And so people started to readjust their expectations and the expectation was higher for longer until all of this shit started happening. And then people were like, oh no, because this, uh, and, and we'll talk about this because the two things together are what matters here. Like if any one of these things happened like on their own in, uh, in, in, in another world, and then we might be all right, but it's, it's the two things together that, that, that matter. But before we touch on that, do you want to just kind of fill in, do you, do you want to go through like the actual timeline of, you know, like what happened with the collapse of these banks on a basic level for people, um, who, all right. who might not know all the stuff. So it begins with Silvergate, uh, which is a which was crypto focused, which is a crypto focused bank that was kind of trying to fill in the fact that stable coin still wasn't good enough for people to turn their crypto assets into money. Um, Not a big surprise there, you know, just with yeah. it being crypto focused and all the crap that has been in the news about the collapse of the FTX and, and how uh, um, how absurd um, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the business practices were there with that stuff with it being unregulated and whatnot so we might excuse silvergate but then two days later uh silicon valley bank yeah silicon uh, valley bank what? has to start s selling assets to meet deposits as deposits are being pulled out when that happens there's a run on the bank now a lot of people blame that you know one of the things that's been said, oh, well, that was an irrational bank run. And even some Democrat was like, oh, we need to censor people to stop that from happening. And I was like, it was a rational bank run. They couldn't. Yes, they were, it was. They, absolutely. They, these were businesses, for one thing. Um, now, we could talk about the rationality of businesses having a whole lot of un uninsured money in a bank over $250,000 in which they don't have private insurance on it. But, right. that, uh, but that, that's a whole other thing. And mm -hmm. the fact that we've had all these venture tech startups that are that have been flush with cash for a decade because of easy lending conditions um mm -hmm. and leveraging uh treasuries versus and venture capital versus debt which is how these tech firms when I, when i say tech firms i should be really specific this is how a lot of these venture capital startup tech firms on speculative technologies were were and just to clarify, yeah, and just clarify, profitable. this bank was the go-to financier for like that sector of the economy. It yeah, it had been since the nineties. Yeah, almost all, uh, or excuse me, half of all the venture capital-backed technology and health companies in the United States. So this was the sixteenth largest bank in the United States. Right. It, it, was a re it was a regional bank, so not as big as like Bank of America, but it was still big and significant for those reasons. This is interesting because it was a regional bank that's regulated differently, which was why it was able to do some of the things it was doing. Um, but it's also why the FDIC ruling was going to be worse because as a regional bank, it had less regulation, but had uh, more liability. So what do I mean by that? Well, like you can do par these huge banks can do parity trades in a way that, that, uh, go to the fed they can borrow stuff quickly to stay solvent um and it goes There's a into, more direct relationship there right um the way the laws work now when when these mid-sized banks go for parity trades they actually have to pay their their debtors first so they have to pay usually the larger banks first then they can save themselves and their depositors so so they're their uh, lack of regulation literally in this case actually does come with more risk. Uh, last week when I talked about this, I did not think the Fed was going to insure all the deposits. I was just like, they're going to, they clearly still kind of at least pretend there's such a thing as moral hazard. So they'll pay out the deposit station. They might, and then they'll liquid, they'll pay out the depositors. Uh, what, what they, you know, the hundred, the 250,000, and then they'll liquidate and pay out as much as they can after they liquidate the bank assets and pay the rest of the deposits out of that. And then what's left over, they're kind of, well, they're not going to pay that out. Well, but they decided that they were so that companies can make payroll, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, that's probably not really why they did it, but that's what they said. This was highly lobbied for by Gavin Newsom, by the way, who also has, you know, stuff tied into Silicon Valley Bank. Surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> but then this started getting worse. And you have what? Uh, Signature Bank. And, and Credit Suisse. Now, Credit Suisse has been kind of cracking up for about a year. All right. So I've been following Credit Suisse for a while. You could actually make the case that this started much earlier with Credit Suisse. They've, they've had like restructuring, um, you know, uh, at, at least once that I'm aware of. So this you can make the case that it has been a long time coming with them. But the point is, is that it's it's potentially coming to a head at entirely the wrong time. And it, like Credit Suisse is like a serious bank and there's like, expo you know, it is a Swiss bank, but there's exposure, you know, there's a lot of exposure in the United States too. And then there's also First Republic. Yep. Uh, First Republic Bank is now also in, in, in trouble. So but before we, we touch on, on, um, on, on those other ones, though, I, I just want to draw attention to the fact that like with, at least with SVG, uh, I want to touch on something you said earlier is is that this is a bank that had a conservative balance sheet. Right. It was it was not like Lehman Brothers where like, you know, they they had put all, like all their money into like mortgage backed securities and like risky like ninja loans and stuff uh, that that uh, wound up, you know, blowing up. Um now, the key thing to keep in mind about like banks is is that they are required to keep, I think it's 10% of like their total deposits like on, re on reserve, uh, meaning that outside of that, they will like, people have these illusions about what happened, what actually happens to their money like when they park it in the bank. Uh, I think a lot of people just think that it just like sits there and waits for them like to use it. When really what the bank is doing is it is loaning out as much of your deposits as it possibly can at any right. given point. And, you know, and so like um, by comparison, SVG, um had uh, 173 billion in customer deposits but it was only loaning out like 75,000 or 74 75,000 in loans so it was less than like 50% loaned and just like by contrast Wells Fargo has like 1.38 trillion in deposits and it's like it recently reported that it's loaning out like 955 billion of that so, you know, um, SVB did not fail because, of like, <laughs> you know, it, it was engaged in anything by, by any uh, reasonable measure would be considered, like, risky banking practices here. Yeah, this is actually a, a, a important to – the only thing that made it risky is it was dealing with venture capital. Like, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, that was that's a factor. Yes, so that is a factor because you know, what what wound up happening is, and here I'm going to explain how the government bonds play into it for people who aren't familiar. So, um, SB, SVB failed because they parked the majority of their uh, their their depositors' money in U.S. government bonds. For example, like the ten year or like the twenty year Treasury note. Um, and which and, is supposed to be the safest fucking bet in the economy, which is why it's low yield. The safest and most risk-free asset in the world. Um, right. <laughs> which is not true because even bonds can lose value. And uh, here, hold on, I'm going to screen share uh, again so that yeah, actually, uh, here's where we start. Yeah. Here's right. where we start to get into uh, the um, the the visuals. I'm going to be a little back and forth here. So, yeah, this is a picture of chart of the 20-year uh, Treasury note, like over the past two or three years. And um, so, you know, um, as, as you can see, like in, you know, um, with, with COVID, people really bid these things up. It's, it's simply not the case. This is something a lot of people don't understand. It's not the case that like Treasury notes are simply auctioned off at like the same price, like everything. Um, no, like they actually fluctuate in value and so you may pay a different price for a, a bond at, at one year than you would in another. And so like uh, there was COVID, there was a flight to safety 
you know, helped bid bond prices up to the highest level we've been in a long time. Um, you know, people got out of risk assets and into this stuff. And then uh, what you have to understand about um, bonds is that there is an inverse relationship between interest rates and bonds. So people are bidding up bond prices at the same time that the Fed is like, has reduced interest rates to uh, next to zero. Um, and, and so, uh, what so they winds up happening is these banks like over the course of the last couple of years like wound up paying a premium for like the these bonds and not only that but like the actual rate of return on the bonds like the interest received for investing in them is like actually really low uh so um you know what 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 winds up happening is uh, that normally people will hold these bonds until they mature, and that even though you may buy them like at a higher price than than the price may be when it actually matures, it doesn't matter whether it's higher or lower. If you invest in a treasury note, you hold it to maturity, you collect interest on. Um, uh, on the bond uh, while it's invested, and then at the end of its maturity, then you receive your full principal plus the interest back at the end. Um, whether or not the price of the bond has fallen or or uh, risen since that time, unless <laughs> you have to sell it early, <laughs> you know, for a loss, and that's what's that's what wound up happening here. Right. Why would people be selling bonds for a loss when there's bot when the treasury note uh, bonds seem to be more valuable? It's because there's a trade off, and you're like, well, I could buy a new treasury bonds for that are paying out at like four percent or five percent versus this this one that I'm going to take a penalty on holding for twenty years. Right. Like that. That's the trade off motivating this on the individual level. Um, so, uh, so just so people know, this is not irrational and it's not unpredictable either. Yeah, uh, it, and, and this is happening also at the same time that you mentioned, like you know, with with like the venture capital playing into this, the 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 risk that came in. There were like a number of different things that all had to like come together for for this to happen. But one of them was like the with like venture capital because you know with the raising of interest rates. Uh, and the tightening of financial con conditions uh, means that there was like less money sloshing around and like uh, uh, access to credit wasn't as easy. And so venture capital was not flowing into like these startups in the same way that it has been, you know, over over the last, you know, however long, 10 years, we can say. And so like VC capital started drying up. Um, which prompted like the the startups to begin to like accelerate you know the 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 withdrawals of um of of their deposits um and, and this was all happening at the same time that like a silicon valley bank is sitting on a mountain of unrealized losses in the form of treasury notes which have declined in value and so um, you know, banks have to stay uh, 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 properly capitalized. They have to have, you know, on their balance sheet, they have to have enough assets um, to cover, you know, their their liabilities. And uh, so, uh, what what winded up happening is. Uh, uh, then S SVB announced that it that it had to sell a bunch of securities at a loss, um, and, and that it would also sell another two billion worth of stock shares to shore up its balance sheet. And then that triggered a panic amongst all the key uh, venture capital firms who reportedly advised their companies to withdraw their money from the bank, and a a bank run ensues, and their stock price begins to plummet. Mm. And so then the FDIC has to take over the bank, liquidate its assets, uh, and here we are. And then the Fed gets involved because the Fed gets involved. 
Um, and then the government insists that it's not a bailout because they're not bailing out the bank with like taxpayer money. What they're what they're doing is, and and this is kind of key to to remember too, is is that you know with 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 Silicon Valley Bank, they we we say that like their uh, their their paper losses exceeded like their asset value. Well, what you don't have you don't have to cover the entire like. All you have to do is cover the spread between um, what um, what the bonds are worth now and what they were worth at the time that they were bought. And so they don't have to cover the entire cost. Uh, so like the FDIC did have like enough money on hand, uh, you know, to to cover this. Uh, but I mean, the, 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 question this continues to happen, like, you know, are they in a position to continue to, to do this? I mean, you know, the, the modern monetary theorists will say yes, that they can do this indefinitely. And in fact, they kind of think that we should have never ended QE policies, uh, that we should go back to 0% interest and, e and, and easy debt. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of Marxists have adopted this for reasons that I'm not quite sure on. Now, I, I will admit, it is true. Government can't run out of currency. What is what is not true is that, um, yeah, it can print as much currency as it wants. Is it going to have value? That's a different, that's a different uh, question entirely. Absolutely. Um, um, now, uh, we also have to deal with the fact that in left economic terms, you and I both talked about this. Since the Ukraine crisis, there's been people predicting that the dollar was about to collapse at any time. Um, interestingly, this might actually... I'm not quite sure what this is going to do, because most of the rest of the world is also running anti-inflationary um, policy right now. The exception is the little bit the Bank of Japan and, and China are willing China, to yeah. are willing to run inflation. Um, China's had its own bank runs in the last year having to do with its housing crisis, though, so that's going to be interesting for them, but it makes some sense what they're doing. The, the question goes, however, is can what would happen if you have 10 to 12% inflation in general index funds indefinitely? in the United States, which I think uh, will become very unpalatable soon. Like, well, we'll, we'll get to that. But if you don't mind, I kind of want to continue to lay out my case to like dr drive the point here about like putting this into perspective about actually what's happening. So go ahead. Like there's, they're saying that like, you know, the, the Silicon Valley bank was insolvent and, you know, and this is not my argument. I'm going to give credit where it's due. This came from a, uh, you know, th this came from a guy, let me pull up his name here. Um, his name is Simon Black. And I guess he runs a, uh, uh, um, a research and advisory group, sovereign research and advisory group. And, you know, it, it, his, his argument is that if Silicon Valley Bank is insolvent, then so is everyone else, like including the Federal Reserve. And, and this is where things really start to get crazy, because like if Silicon Valley Bank failed due to losses in its portfolio of government bonds, um, and pretty much everybody else is, is at risk as well, because like Wells Fargo recently reported like 50 billion in unrealized losses on its bond portfolio. And that is a huge chunk of their capital. Um, really, anybody who's purchased long term government bonds, whether it's you know like banks or brokerages, uh, corporations like state and local governments, they're all sitting on enormous losses right now on paper. Um, and that includes like, all right. So, so there's, we talked about like the, the, the FDIC, the federal mm -hmm. deposit insurance corporation. Um, they estimate that uh, U S banks are sitting at roughly 650 billion in losses. And just to put that in perspective, that is sim in size to these total subprime losses in the United States back in 2008. And if interest rates keep rising, then those losses won't continue to increase. 
So is that's all like not absurd enough. What's extremely ironic and actually a bit funny is is uh, about this is, is that the FDIC is supposed to guarantee bank deposits. In fact, they manage a special fund called the Deposit Insurance Fund uh, or the DIF. And that insures customer deposits at banks across the United States, including the deposits the now defunct Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, but the, the DIF's balance sheet right now is only at like around $128 billion versus the $650 billion in unrealized losses in the banking system. Um, so, so here's what's really crazy, though. This is going to make you laugh, Derek, because... Where does the DIF invest that 128 billion? Yes. I have no idea. In government bonds. Bonds, yeah. <laughs> so even the FDIC is suffering realized losses in its insurance fund, which is supposed to bail out banks that fail from their unrealized losses. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, dude. It's 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 uh, because FDIC ridiculous. is holding government bonds that are like way less valuable than current government currently issued government bonds, right? Is that the is that the issue? I don't um, I don't know that to be true. I just I mean like even the institution that's supposed to you know, to 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 be there to bail this out is is funded through government essentially bonds. they're 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 really you know I cannot see that they are an any like like significantly different position than the rest of all of these banks and so you know like the fed is sitting on billions of dollars of unrealized losses against just a little bit of capital and and by by silicon valley bank's standards that would make them completely and totally insolvent as well and we're talking about the most important central bank in the world. Apparently, it's hopelessly insolvent and far more broke than Silicon Valley Bank. So, you know, if that's the case, then what could possibly go wrong here? Well, I mean, theoretically, since it's a government-related organization, they can flood it with, 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 with more bonds. Like, but... Again, what would that eventually do to the bond market? That's you, well, it would, would, would that, I mean, I can't see how that wouldn't devalue currency. Um, well, the, the question is, uh, the question that MMTers always bring up to me is they, they go, well, why didn't QE lead to general inflation? And I was like, because it inflated assets. And even you admit that the, the general assets were inflated. And since people weren't spending that money, it didn't get it didn't increase the money supply because it was literally just being hoarded by people in portfolios um and it's it is totally fictitious capital um in that there's no there's no like productive anything tied to yes. that money like yes yeah um so you know it can yeah, come and go like, as you know, it's, it's <laughs> non productive spending Right. Uh, and, and also just like the, the general economic conditions under which like you implement QE, you're going to affect whether or not that happens. Like if you do it, you know, like, um, well, the after, thing about like, the QE financial... is what we're realizing. I think this is important to realize we have disincentivized investing into productive industry because, uh, as opposed to weird shit like crypto or venture capital or whatever, because you could level returns off of debt easier than you could level uh, slow returns on productive investment. And what you see is like these massive families having, you know, huge portfolios that are not invested into things that you would consider like, you know, reinvesting in the economy and, and yeah, it's, it's also all contingent upon like every everybody essentially like living under massive levels of debt like all the time. Right. Which, you know, which is happening right now because there was a downtick in debt during the first part of COVID because people paid off their debt with their COVID uh, checks. And then, yeah, and then inflation came and then people blew, and, blew their COVID savings and then like they've been living like off of credit in order to keep pace with inflation yeah, for like the last year. Credit cards have been ballooning for the last year. And... What is interesting is, yeah. is uh, you know, despite what the Fed says, 
because credit because credit's been ballooning, what we can see is like it's had no effect on the credit market. Like it, it, if this was actually going to fight inflation, you would see less lending from banks. That has not happened, right? Yeah. Like, um, so, but th- I guess this brings us to another key point. Um, what does it mean then when we are because as long as the U.S. dollar is accepted on the global market for exchange for real goods, um, there, there is a way in which like the government can basically print itself out of the situation because what will happen is the cap, what happens is the capital outflows of dollars go into reserve currencies and pull them out of our own market. Um, okay. So fine. What happens when people start really valorizing that? Um, and that's a that's a pretty serious question. Um, it's, how- a, it's a very serious question, and, and it's and it's related to the question of like, you know, w- one of the, one of the things that you and I touched upon in our last talk is like, I don't know if you were on the same page with me uh, about this or not, but like I raised the suggestion that maybe there wasn't really actually all that much actual like real economic productivity behind I, I mentioned that it's really only been since about like around the time they got tr- that Trump got elected that I feel like the economy is like actually normalized and I suspected and I still kind of suspect that there really isn't actually like a whole lot of real economic activity like under underpinning that because we like we've been addicted to to QE the 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 whole time, and uh, the, the problem with QE is like it, it pulls growth forward. Um, yeah. Well, th- this is this is something that I that I have been talking about too, because I'm like, okay, why have all the tech stuff that you've used suck? Like, okay, why does Facebook suck? Why do all these massive, you know, super quote profitable unquote? Uh, tech firms seem to blow. Um, and I'm like, because they haven't had, they haven't been tied to production, thus there's been real no check on what they can and cannot do. And so they developed under conditions where they pretty much couldn't fail. And then they started failing under COVID because we started pulling back QE. And it became very quick, very clear that a whole lot of this was basically leveraging investment off debt the entire yes. time. Yes. Like, um, and that investment isn't going anywhere else. Then I started looking at like, okay, so we, we factor out the Forbes 500 individuals because in some ways that's new money shit. That's stupid bitch stuff. If you are, are uh, excuse me, I will correct myself for people who, it's, it's dumb shit. If you yeah. are, um, uh, uh, really looking at, um, Why is it dumb? Um, because a lot of that stuff is very inflated uh, accounts that are just nominal. Like, like what is we've always talked about? Like, I you know I had an argument with one of one of your fellow uh, mates about Elon Musk once, and I I just pointed out to him it's like, well, none of these tech things have been profitable ever until they're profitable off of weird specula- <laughs> speculation. Um, and it's like, yeah. well, what do you mean? I'm like, well. Like Tesla is profitable because of carbon credit maneuvers. Like Tesla's never made money off cars. Tesla's made money off of selling offsets of carbon credits. It's literally yeah. like a government enabled pseudo market. Right. All right. Um, and I mean, so- just case in point, Elon Musk is the richest person in the world, not because of, like he's he's in, like accrued like a ton of like he's, he's created like some super profitable kind it's literally because there was there's a spec you know like the liquidity driven like speculative stock market bubble that like uh and then a, a bunch of people short sold tesla precisely because they didn't think that it would it could be profitable for a lot of these reasons and they still may yet get the last laugh but the point being is is that you know um there there's also like this this sort of like um, uh, ESG, you know, investing, uh, 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 trend that's kind of like, um, uh, been, been, 
driven based in part by like you know the civilities of like millennials and and zoomers towards you know like environmentally friendly policies and stuff and all these things came together to like they exploded text tesla stock price like overnight and then all the short sellers had to cover and then Elon Musk sold a bunch of stock and like the the, the tesla stock price has absolutely nothing to do with like the actual valuation of the company or, or like the the underlying like fundamentals of its business right and there's a lot of that with these asset bubbles so you look at the you look at where you look at family money for where like real money is okay and you see that they're still the old productive like yeah. all the big families are the old productive families of like fordism they're like literally those people but you look at what they're mm -hmm. investing in now and like i was i was talking to someone I was talking to Stefan Bertram Lee and I was like, why the fuck is, why does it seem like the bourgeoisie just doesn't care anymore? Like, where are they at? They seem to be totally out the lunch. What has happened? Like, and, <laughs> and, uh, and then I started looking at this family, these family investment profiles. I'm like, they haven't needed to make money off of real business because of speculative stock assets for 20 years. Yeah. And thus they're not. And so they have no reason to invest either publicly or privately. So like, that's why they don't care about our silly little culture war stuff because it's not relevant to them. They're going to continue making uh, money. And, the, and, and I think, you know, I know people really care about cultural issues. I don't want to say they're all meaningless, but I'm like, from a business perspective, they're pretty much neutral. Like, what, what, you right. know, um, so, you know, Where's all the politics gone? I'm like, it's been it's been it's been going into like creating captive markets and creating exceptions to regulations, etc. And normally, historically, that has been driven by Republicans, but in the last ten years, uh, it's been bipartisan totally. I mean, Dodd, I mean, Bernie Frank, uh, Barney Frank was one of the people arguing for the exceptions to his own fucking law, <laughs> uh, for like for the bank, you know. Um, for the situation that led to like Silicon Valley Bank, you know, um, so what do we see here? Well, we there's no one at the wheel. We, um, it's also pretty clear, and this is where that that show Breaking Points is going to be somewhat interesting. That it seems like the at least from the Fed perspective, it is totally fine for there to be absolute moral hazard on 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 the average person. Uh, and then when you add in court cases like undoing student loan forgiveness, and I'm going to like caveat that with, I know Biden's forgiveness would not fix the problem of student loans. You don't have to at me period, <laughs> but, but, uh, it really is hard to argue moral hazard for, for like students and the cost of that when you're hemorrhaging billions of treasury dollars towards keeping, uh, oh, ab absolutely. Moment. Like, you know, the, 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 that's that's the whole uh, that's the whole old Margaret Thatcher point is that there's, you know, that there's no public money, uh, that there's 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 only, um, you know, th there's only money from, you know, basically from taxpayers, <laughs> it, which all is like clearly bullshit. Like, you know, if you can throw billions of 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 uh, dollars of worth of made up money at you know at, um at this shit then like very clearly you could you could do it you know for 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 any of these number of, of other things with respect to you know um financing student debt and higher education in in uh in this country and, and and by the way you don't have to at me either you know like i i don't think this should be like any part of like any uh avowedly like left-wing platform or anything like that it's just like you know from a fiscal perspective it's just manifestly true right it's just like if you can if you can hemorrhage money towards that towards keeping these banks solvent and you're like well it's also you know you'll have people say what's well, also keeping these people employed i'm like yeah but it would be almost cheaper at this point just to i don't know have unemployment for this sector that covers their costs until this was over. I like, that seems like that actually might be cheaper than giving you guys all your losses back. Um, so it's, you, you know, it's just even it's funny. I listen to Patrick Boyle a lot and he's just like, you know, he was saying, you know, he did the thing that I think is a little bit disingenuous, which was like, well, they didn't have a risk assessor at, at Silicon Valley bank. And I was like, yeah, but that's not why it, it was failed. That's right. bullshit. I'm I'm glad that you mentioned that because really before I talked about like what it all means and like what we sort of expect to happen moving forward, 
like it, it begs the question like why did this happen like in other words wh why didn't this not happen uh right. because since 2008 the government is, is is rolled out a parade of of new rules, you know, to prevent like another banking crisis, you know, and one of those is that banks have to pass stress tests, which are like basically like war game scenarios uh, to see whether or not banks be able to survive like you know certain fluctuations uh, in, in like macroeconomic conditions. Mm -hmm. And SVB passed all of its stress tests with flying colors. Yep. It also passed uh, FDIC examinations. Um, it, it passed its financial audits. Uh, Which is why the whole uh, Reich yeah. argument doesn't fix the problem, because that was about financial audits and stress tests. and so, They've done all that. It didn't right. show up. So, so the point is, is that SVB was followed by, you know, dozens of like Wall Street analysts and, you know, <laughs> You know, they all issued like emphatic buy ratings on the stock, even after like analyzing like its financial statements. And and by the way, Silicon Valley Bank is not like uh, op uh, opaque about like this issue either. Just like in late January, they issued like an annual report in which like they laid out uh, the their like assets versus liabilities. This is this was not like a secret. And like all of the warning signs were there, but again, the experts failed. Uh, the, the the FDIC saw, you know, what kind of condition the bank was in, and they did nothing. The Federal Reserve saw what kind of condition they were in, did nothing, and then the investors cheered and bid the stock up. Right. I was about to say, there's there it, the, the only thing that you could say is that SBB SBB was allowed to do. Uh, mark to market accounting, but every bank's allowed to do mark to market accounting, which is probably part of the reasons why these stress tests don't work. But, and for those of you who did, mark to market is one of those things that's ironically named because it's like market at time of purchase versus market value at the current moment. Yeah, but, yeah. It's, it's, it's called, uh, what do you, what do you call it? Like, um, I think it's called like asset mismatch. And this, yeah. and that's, per, that's precisely along the lines which, uh, which this failed, like the the uh, the stress test didn't take um, the maturity mismatch mismatches into account. And by the way, I want to plug somebody that I really respect here and that informs like my financial outlook. This is a guy. I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna screen share um, again here. Um, half a second. This is a guy named A.V. Gilbert. I talked about him last time I was on here. He is my favorite financial analyst. And uh, there are a number of reasons why this is the case. You know, last time you and I talked about like um, Elliott Wave theory and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, the, one of the reasons why I respect this guy is, is uh, because of his track record. Uh, mm -hmm. Just point blank. You know, and by the way, nobody, you're right, uh, that nobody holds <laughs> these left wing economists accountable for their predictions, Derek. Ever, uh, ever, ever. But with this guy uh, on February 20th, he, he um, so, so he's he's been harping on this for like the last three years. And he started up a thing called Safer Banking Research about three years ago, where he has been doing research on the balance sheets of uh, the banks. And his, con his conjecture is that uh, the balance sheets, are not just of like these, these small local and regional banks, but uh, really the large banks still are in highly questionable shape. And also that uh, the, 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 it's, it's arguable whether or not the government, you know, in the event of another crisis, will be in a position to bail them out again this time. And so he's been putting out in conjunction with some other outlet. Uh, uh, I'm not, I, I can't remember who, uh, a website called saferbankingresearch.com. Um, he publishes in other places too. I think AB also runs ElliottWaveTrader.com, and he mm -hmm. publishes in like um, on on Seeking Alpha frequently, which is uh, a, a really uh, good go-to place for you know um, um, uh, for 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 stock and, and asset research. But he puts out this article on February twentieth in 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 which he says that the the Fed stress tests. Uh, do not account for uh, for for asset mismatches, 
And then like three weeks later, like uh, banks start collapsing as, as a result of it. And I was just floored. And the guy has been saying uh, the whole time, <laughs> this is his most recent art, uh, article, is your money really safe? I wouldn't bank on it. <laughs> uh, we are seeing initial cracks in bank stability, time to be cautious. Um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, th this, this is a guy worth taking a look at when there's, when, when there's somebody out there uh, saying, pay attention to this shit. And then the shit that they start saying might happen starts to happen. They means they might actually have something to say. And so, yeah, anybody who's watching or listening, um, might, might check that guy out. Um, but you know, beyond it's like that, him and Kuro Rabini have been the people who have been like, they're usually consistently right. Um, and I want to call out some people because, like, you know, for example, I've been dealing with MMTers for a long time. And they, well, I do think some of their research program is fine as historical work goes. Uh, um, I have pointed out that their predictions have been, like, uniformly wrong. Um, one of the things that was coming up in the 2019-2020 is that during the beginning of COVID, a lot of the MMTers were predicting a deflationary crisis. And there was a plausible reason to believe that because we were bordering on deflationary levels of, you know, um, of, of, of an inflation for at least a couple of years there. Um, but, you know, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty. That didn't last. Well, what I was afraid of is what I think kind of happened, which was that eventually these asset appreciations, people would stop trusting in the market and they would have to start investing into real to real investments, I, AKA property. And then you'd see a property spike and then that would have all kinds of downstream conditions. But then also that whenever the, the other thing that I think we've seen is whenever there's supply chain breakdowns, there's also opportunistic price raises. Like mm, absolutely so, eggs, eggs yeah, recently. Right. So like, it's suit, like usually there's a real supply problem and there's a price related to that but then everybody else raises their prices because they can or because they're afraid of potential inflation later so which of course ensures potential inflation later um so it, it's it's a very funny thing that happens there um so when we look at all this together though i have to ask you i mean we, we started off with the question about like supposedly in 2007 we saw a quote return to marxism mm -hmm based off of the financial crisis because i would i recently read reread baudrillard's writing for, I, I think he died in 2007 it's a book published in 2010 but it was like i probably written in 2005 or 2006 where baudrillard is basically um uh saying that uh the, the crisis of capital is over um there's no longer going to be a biking cycle we don't have to worry about the primary contradictions or like class struggle or whatever and of course, you know, capital rears its ugly head again. Um, but I think people forgot that that was like a common opinion amongst a, a lot of leftists in the aughts. Um, that like the primary problems we had were war, they were politics, they weren't economic. Um, uh, I think that that's not the case, obviously, but uh, and history didn't bear any of that out. Um, well, I mean, there was some focus on like, you know, the, you know, the, the nineties left was driven, you know, um, in a big way by, you know, anti-globalization. So it's not like it was entirely absent, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's you know, important to remember then that a lot of, a lot of that was, um, a lot of that was determined by the fact that like it was much easier to like uh, dismiss Marxism as completely irrelevant in the 1990s in the wake of the collapse of, of the, the, the Soviet Union and, um, and, and the fall of the wall than it was to treat, you know, like Marxism, you know, as, as anything uh, like, like a, a, a real threat. And so like a, a sort of backing off from like a, uh, um, you know, the, the looking at, at this through like the lens of the economy, um, I think was, was, um, was informed by that a bit, certainly. Um, um, but it's not as if it wasn't there at all. Hmm. 
So, um, I guess that that le that leads us to a question, though. What has Marxism consisted of since the crash? You would think if the crash started this renewed interest in Marxism, that it would have been a more politically, a more economically or p political economically informed Marxism. Well, in, in, this is a bit tricky because there's a number of things that I think would be fruitful for us to kind of touch in here. But my first is just sort of real basic point, which is that like, you know, if, and I won't disagree with you. Um, I think you're absolutely correct when you say that like the financial crisis, it, it put um, like, anti-capitalism or the the idea of post-capitalism like um it, not only did it give it like a like a second chance at, at life so to speak but it was actually responsible then for like inserting it or reinserting it into like a uh, mainstream course uh, that is 100% true and you know we we saw that with like this explosion of the blogosphere um that uh that happened in in large part because like there weren't um you know a, a lot of like independent outlets out there that were capable of um speaking to things um out, outside of of like the 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 sort of accepted terms of like economic discourse around that. Like you saw like sort of mainstream media trying, but like not really knowing how. And so it did provide like a really unique platform. But I guess my point with all that is, is that like, what good was it if this is what it led to? If where we are right now with like the collapse of like neo-social democracy, which is like a totally weak and like regrettable uh, uh so, sort of um ex expression or culmination of like uh, the left in the new millennium then like then what good was it i don't know i mean the question is like one of the first things that seems to you know I'm not one of those people who thinks Marxism is just an economic theory, but I want to make that very clear to people. I don't, I don't think that it's a, it's a larger, a set of, uh, it's not even a set of propositions. It's a larger project than that. But um, one of the things that I've noticed about, you know, and I'm also like willing to say uh, that you could say, well, parts of Marxism are wrong and still be a Marxist. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that if you admitted it. But there's been a whole lot of like conjecture about what you know this form of socialism is, which posits things that I don't even think make sense for left, not just Marxists, but leftists to even posit. So, for example, I've been trying to get people to understand why, like, maybe having zero percent interest rates was actually better for investors and maybe like uh speculators than it was for either business or for any common person even if shrinking that's going to hurt common people and it's because in that environment um it's very easy for people to have capital just quickly accumulate more capital if there's no cost if there's no risk associated with borrowing you have capital for collateral there's no risk associated with borrowing get more and there's no reason to reinvest in anything productive either right because why would you do that? You're going to make more money off of these speculative assets that are more liquid and can pay off quicker. Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, that, that like is fine from the individual capitalist standpoint, but it's a disaster for, for, for like the actual functioning economy, which explains stuff like why it took so long to normalize. And, and I don't know how you feel this Matt, but I think if, if COVID had not happened, we would have had a recession by 2020, 2021 anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I certainly, without going at great length uh, to explain why, I 100% I, I agree with that. Mm. I mean, so, they were they were already they were already ringing the alarm bells on like the asset bubble by that time. So a lot of times, like people think the market follows the news. The market doesn't really actually follow the news. Like 
I would even go as far to argue that like the market is like this sort of like form of AI in the sense that like it knows things like are gonna happen like really before they do. And then just like people attribute like these particular headlines um, like arbitrarily to sort of explain or justify like what the market has done after the fact. Um, now the second part is is a bit a bit speculative, but um, the 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 first part is not. Yeah, that's that that's a huge thing. So if we have to ask ourselves, did we saw this rebirth of Marxism? What have we gotten from it? We haven't seen. You and I have both been also, even though we're both union, you know, trade unionists. We also point out that like most of the narratives coming out of left about trade unions are about transitory workers in small fields. And that doesn't map on at all to the larger labor market, even if there is truth of like labor militancy out there. It hasn't been organized in any way that's been effective. Um, um, no, I mean, I just I just want to say like one of one of the things that really bothers me about this. And I don't know if any of my any of my fellow trade unionists like, you know, it, because I am active in my union, I will clarify. But, you know, I I don't talk to a lot of people about it in political context, uh, but you know, with the few people that I do, like I don't see like my union activity like through a political lens like at all. <laughs> and you know, I run into like a lot of DSA types like in it, um, which which really doesn't mean anything because so many things. Almost all the DMFA types so are like temporary are like young staffers. Like that's almost when I what I almost always deal with when I deal with DSA people. I've never there's there there's like two DSA people uh, I've met as teachers here in Utah, and they're not in they're not like super active in the union. Um, and then the people who I met were DSAers were usually hired staffers, which which makes sense because if you read Jay McEvery's book, that's how they thought like political unionizing mm -hmm. was going in, uh, you know, doing these these staff works and organizing for like lobbying wins at the national level. Like that's what a lot of people took away. I think mistakenly from Jay McEvery's work. That's what that's like been, been guiding a lot of the millennial left to use a term from your people. Uh, but I think it's actually accurate here because it is generational um, strategy on this, but it's not paid off at all. And what it's actually done is recapitulated the same problems that we had with staffers in the seventies and eighties, like almost verbatim. Like you have a whole lot of people who are now at odds with rank and file who are also like calling people off for fights with the Democrats when the Democrats are, you know, I think the railroad strike made that immediately apparent. You know what I mean? Um, and so we can't even say that we've benefited from that, even though that's in the, that's in the narrative. One of the things that bothers me about it though, is like mainstream publications pick up that democratic socialist narrative which means it must be benefiting someone in power for them to pick it up because it's often really misleading if you break the numbers down. Like, for example, the whole, like, we've had, what was it, in 2021, we had uh, um, 600 requests for new unions that got authorized, right? But, like, 400 of them were Starbucks by themselves, and they were in shops of 10 or of, of 20 to 40. Absolutely. And that's what this is about is that, you know, there's, there's been a lot of like mainstream, like, um, like, like press attention on this because what, what is the press, you know, need more than a story. And that's exactly what it is. It's a story that they're running. Doesn't it? Doesn't mean that like you know it has teeth to it. And, and, and now it doesn't mean that it's empty either, because you know this is all bound up, you know, in in some of the, the broader changes that have both occurred, you know, um, in the labor market due to COVID. It's a part of the sort of the Great Resignation moment, and then it's also um, as a result of sort of like generational shifts and attitudes i do think that like attitudes towards labor unions like finally bottomed out and then you know now uh, apparently they are at like a um a, a multi-decade high yeah but and, no and so, one's joining the unions though yeah, <laughs> exactly and and in fact like uh the 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 total um size of the unionized workforce in the United States, even though union applications were up 
like 50% year over year between like uh, uh, like uh, pre and post COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the unions have still not grown because even though they've grown, they have grown uh, less quickly than the rest of the non-unionized workforce. And so if you think about that, like some from like a sort of like um, organizing perspective, you know, which in increasingly in the wake of the collapse of like neo-social democracy, uh, a lot of uh, leftists have sort of like chosen recently to sort of cast like they're to like cast their lot there and, and, and we're experiencing a bit of a like a, re, a retreat <laughs> into into labor like in in the wake of that then essentially what that means is that there's um presently a tremendous uh, uh, ex expending of effort on behalf of all, a lot of, not everybody, obviously, but a lot of people on the left in such a manner that does not even translate with it, like, um, making gains that can keep up with the growth of like the rest of the workforce. Uh, and this sort of echoes, uh, concerns with, you know, if you keep track of what happened at like the most recent labor notes conference, you know, or, uh, the, 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 present head of the AFL CIO uh, laid out this uh, this new goal. I, I forget exactly what it was, but it was something like we're going to organize like a million people in like um, X amount of years. And and then it was like, it was like less than one percent a year. And I was like, well, <laughs> yeah, like that doesn't even like that doesn't even keep up with population growth. I mean, yes, yes. Like, when you run the numbers on this, it's completely nonsensical, like. It's just, it's only viable if you don't understand the, you don't understand the numbers. And one of the other things that I find paradoxical, but kind of obvious if you think about it, uh, union membership as a whole is, is gone up union. There's a positive view of unions as a whole, but not of specific unions. So it's, well, uh, I'll tell you what though, is that, um, the, the people who are filing for, um, you know, with the NLRB, uh, in a big way are not really doing it with the big unions, you know, what have, no. and especially you can just look at the, the sort of the headline stories of this too. What have been the sort of the big stories of the last couple of years, as far as labor organizing goes, it's been like independent efforts, like, uh, uh, Starbucks workers United and then, um, um, Amazon labor union. The only uh, big growth in new unions from the, I mean, in, in new union membership from old unions has been that the old union scrambling to organize uh, TAs and universities. Um, like it's like the United Auto Workers is representing California TAs. And oh yeah. Which I always kind of found nonsensical, like the idea of like UAW, like representing like, like grad students and stuff. Just like, I don't, I don't know. Right, yeah, when that, the, and I point out the problem with this is like not that grad students don't deserve. Uh, uh, well, they certainly deserve better than the UAW. God, the yeah, UAW no, is so fucking bad. Yes, and actually, <laughs> my interview with people, uh, I've interviewed someone who was involved in that effort, and they pretty much said the same thing. But uh, even though they're UAW members, but one of the things that I would I would actually even say beyond that is, I very few people seem to be willing to point out that like these are transitory workforces. These are not going to lead to long-term members for the unions it's just a temporary cash flow and it from from the standpoint of union bureaucracy this is this is perversely incentivized because you have oh, no yeah. yeah you have no like, threat to these it. people they right? don't, don't re yeah they don't really like stay i mean really if you're and and i'm asking people to humor me by looking at this through like the most cynical lens but let's just assume that like uh, we're talking about a union assume you're a part of it and that like that that local union like represent you sucks ass and like they they don't do their jobs and they're just you know there to to, to, to siphon money you know off of the members through dues then what would somebody like that really want they would want a transitory workforce that uh, uh yeah th there is an industry there for that and that's that's kind of a huge problem because you transitory workers can't even, they can't really stay in the union long enough to form a, a viable counter power block. They're not going to be um, viable for rank and file organizations for long, et cetera. So, you know, it's pretty useful for stagnation. Um, I, I guess the next question becomes if, if, 
if we didn't see Marxists do much in labor and we didn't see them do much in uh, in economic understanding, um, and in fact, if anything, uh, modes of, of Marxism that were focused on economics became less popular after 2012, I think. Um, I, I uh, placed a lot, of, honestly, and, you know, this is going to sound like an oversimplification, but my conjecture is that a lot of that just had to do with Obama. I mean, okay. like, really, I mean, it was like after 2008, you know, uh, and it took, I think, a lot of the wind out of, out of the left, uh, you know, uh, for, for various reasons. And then, you know, you had the whole, you know, Richard Wolf and and um, who, who else were popular um, left economists around that time? David uh, Harvey, although he isn't actually an economist, he's a geologist. Yeah, a geographer, uh, not a geologist. Sam, yeah. what's his name? Um, uh, uh, Leo Panich. Yeah, um, was popular. Uh, Andrew Climate was to some degree popular, although kind of mm -hmm. niche. Um, that's all fallen yeah. out. I like, I like, I like Leo Panish well, well enough, but, um, you know, a lot, a lot of these other guys though, um, you know, when, when I look at like the leftists that were, um, you know, uh, when I think of the Marxists who were like supposedly like the most serious about the economy, like most, if not all are sort of like politically impotent or immature. So I don't know how like how much value there ever was to like focusing on the economics, which which could uh, like uh, or, or 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 really focusing and like zeroing in on on the economics, uh, which could sort of use as a useful segue to uh, you know to to take up uh, you know something that you and I privately had had uh, touched upon recently, which is you know your your remarks about. Um, during your tenure in Platypus, you didn't get the sense that, you know, that, uh, that we were really strong on Marxist economics. Right. I, I, th that was my critique. We never talked about it the two years I was in the uh, in the organization. Now, that could have just been, uh, as I've as I've tried to clarify, my particular branch, mm -hmm. uh, which was very specifically located in Seoul. And then we also we hosted people who did talk about economics. Like that's how I met Andrew Kleiman personally is we hosted him at a, at a panel. Um, but it didn't but, appear to be like, you know, um, a, like a really strong focal point of like platypus pedagogy. Right. And, and to be fair, like at the time, Patron was actually arguing with, uh, with Kleiman back when they spoke to each other, um, that, uh, there was a danger in over reducing Marxism to just an economic theory. Um, and I think he's, I think he's absolutely right. There is a danger of economism there. Conversely though, I, I've met a lot of Marxists now who are like total political determinist. And I also think you can't be that like, like that it, because, it, uh, you know, that, that pretends that like class isn't really anything but a for it's, uh, for itself category, which I don't think is actually what Marx implies. Um, so, but you, you said, you know, you, you responded to me that like, you know, there actually have been work done and uh, you mentioned um, that, you know, Platypus had been talking about like Friedrich Pollock, which I know just off of a, a conversation I had with Spencer Leonard, he was very concerned about this, what he called the slandering of Pollock in the discussions by the new hein uh, Heinrich Grossman I faction of the left that has become popular in the last like uh, five or six years. Not super popular, but it's definitely where those more economically minded have gone who aren't like doing Marxist m &T or something like that. Well, let's, let's just sort of like try and, 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 and treat these things like, uh, you know, one, one at a time. Okay. So like, with respect to like whether platypus is like weak on Marxist economics, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Hell, I know I am. Um, you know, I am really not a great person to talk about this. Uh, I am not strong on Marxist political economy. Like, I'm just not. 
Like I know that about myself. Yeah, I guess I'll just say that over. Um, so, you know, is platypus weak on, on, you know, Marxist economics? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I know I am. Um, you know, I, it's certainly a weak point for me, uh, and I won't pretend that it's not. Um, but, you know, there are other people in the organization who that's not true for. Um, Spencer, no. Leonard, Spencer, Spencer Leonard. Spencer Leonard. Uh, Danny Jacobs is really good on uh, political economy. Um, who else? Uh, Atiyah uh, Khan, um, Khan is good. Uh, um, uh, Reed Kane knows his capital, like backwards, forwards, and sideways. Actually, like he could almost Reed, quote quote from memory stuff from like three thousand pages of work. So it's not yeah. nothing. It's not. Um, but is it a like a huge focal point of like platypus's pedagogy, like especially like in the reading group? No, probably not. And like so we do some stuff with like Marx on commodity fetishism and we do some stuff on like sur surplus value and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, like we're admittedly more concerned with Marx's political and historical writing. Mm. So, like, thinking back about the reading group, and it's been a, quite a while since I've ran one now, but several years, but thinking back to, like, you know, how we begin the reading group, we begin it with, like, Lukács and Reich. Uh, and, and we do it because they're really, like, thinking through what class consciousness means. Like, for instance, with Reich, you know, he understood that, you know, psychology plays like a huge factor in what makes workers revolutionary. Like, it wasn't mm -hmm. just simply like a bread and butter issue, uh, because, of course, you know, bread and butter issues like also led them to fascism. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I think that's uh, I think that that actually is. I was actually thinking about that. One thing I'll say is that the reading list has gotten, I went back and looked at it from when I was in the organization in 2012. And when I first started interacting with platypus, which was in 2011. Um, and I left in 2013. So like I was a fellow traveler for a year and I was in the organization, organization proper for like, I think a year and a half. Um, but I was in Asia. So like we were a group of three people. Like, you know, mm -hmm. and only two of us were full members. Um, and we answered to uh, the New York chapter. So I actually didn't even interact with like the chief pedagogy people. The people I really talked to were like, at the time, Pam Nagalis to a lesser degree. I, uh, Laura Rojas, I was, I knew Wasp Wolf when he was in the organization way back then, um, which he left, uh, or was, depending on who you hear, left or was removed around the same time I left. Um, but, I've actually noticed that the it, the reading the reading cycle has actually expanded. It's not actually got everything that I remember reading is still there because we started off with like, you know, uh, Lukasz, uh, Reich, and Kolakowski, uh, mm -hmm. and the idea of the left uh, essay. Um, still there. Yeah, and it's still there. It's just there's a lot more expansion of it now. There's a lot more, uh, you know, they, they have. One would expect a reading like any pedagogical program to get refined and expanded um, over the course of uh, what well, platypus has been around now for what, 25 years? No, since, since no, not that long, um, but it's, going it's on, going on 20, it's 20. It's been a while. I mean, cause it came out of the, you know, I, well, I mean, Platypus's initial intervention was for a completely different left. I mean, it was for the left of like the anti-war left of right. uh, of the aughts. Um, and and you know, I think people get caught up in the superficiality of like what sometimes I call the troll articles. I know I know that both Spencer and Catron would not appreciate me calling them that, but. Uh, are you know are the articles like why not Trump, um, etc., um, and also articles like Lenin's li liberalism, which I think is really funny given how that is like no longer in a certain framework as controversial as it once was. Like it was super controversial in the uh, 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 
in the early aught teens. Well, so much of this stuff has just been like de defanged and, you know, right. Rightfully so, because like the whole point, I think, in, in, in publishing a lot of it, whether we published it or not, whether it's like the boycott letter or, or not, is that like in hindsight, a lot of this stuff just is not all that controversial anymore like you know even with, with respect to the 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 why not trump stuff and i know there was some discussion of of this when you were on on ben burgess's podcast and you kind of went through your your whole history and stuff and i guess somebody from platypus called in and, and and you discussed this is that there seems to be like a lot more of a recognition now that like it was it was a huge thought exercise <laughs> like nobody mm -hmm. in platypus wanted you to go vote for trump i mean if you want to do that privately, like in your own time, like we're we're not going to stop you. But the point is, like socialists shouldn't give a shit, you know, like which capitalist politician, you know, uh, from which ruling class party is actually like in power. All of it, all it was is just a giant thought exercise it was, uh, to challenge people to ask themselves whether if all of the reasons that people say that they hate Donald Trump are really actually things which were already there or present in some some uh, form or another. And, and so, you know, there does seem to be like a bit of like declawing of this stuff. And I'm really grateful for that because like then it, it kind of does uh like disarm our organization in a way uh, that allows us to say okay then if we aren't just out there like trying to troll and uh we certainly aren't out there in bad faith uh because let me tell you, dude, even if you are trying to do something in bad faith, like 20 years is a long fucking time to, <laughs> to do right, that. Well, Hold to such like a such a low bar. Of none like, of you have like gone over into the right wing media sphere, which is like, OK, so like what what would normally happen if, if that was true? OK, just to be like if this was cynical, right, is mm -hmm. there would have been a. Well, we were Marxist. Now we're some kind of populist. Now we're some kind of just standard conservative. And we're we have still saying, yeah, we're still saying the same shit, more or less, just in different contexts. We have remained remarkably consistent. Yeah, in, uh, uh, in what uh, we're saying over time, and and so you know, to sort of, uh, if, if I may, to kind of take the opportunity to point back around to that in context of you know um, uh, the specific context of uh, economism, or not, excuse me, not economism, but you know, like political economy or or Marxist economics or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it, it's, is that, you know, not only is it not clear to me that like being stronger on Marxist economics would provide some kind of like serious edge in understanding like the long arc of the development and the failure of socialist politics, like over the last 200 years, uh, you know, not only is, is, is that true, uh, but you know, I guess what I would say is this, is that like the reason that we haven't had a global revolution is not because there aren't enough capital reading groups. And, and oh, that's, yeah, just, that, that's, that's just true. Th that's <laughs> just obvious. You know, it's just manifestly true. And Platypus's point is that like, you know, the splintering of the economy from politics, like within bourgeois consciousness, like it's affected Marxism. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is to recover this kind of like lost political and historical consciousness, because I will point out that one of the things that like this sort of beef that like platypus is weak on economic issues takes for granted uh, is, is the the, um, the the sort of the splintering or the compartmentalization um, of these disciplines to begin with. You know what I mean when I say that? Yeah. I mean, political economy is political economy, but also like it would always present itself as separate. And I really the problem that you have. OK, um, because I actually think a lot of people uh, don't entirely understand some of my points about this, because I do think a lot of people's responses are economistic and that they become economically determinist in very simple, clear ways and thus think that basically this next crisis means that they're going to get what they want. Right. I mean, that 
that that that is a lot of what the economy or the other kind of economism, which is actually a classically what the term meant, is you just thought that like Joseph Stupinter style or 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 Edward Bernstein style that capitalism was just going to evolve into socialism because it had through through monopoly capital and that was it was and those were two forms of inevitability and you know platypus's main uh focus when i was in there was trying to understand the nature of quote regression unquote like why did it seem like we could not get out of a cul-de-sac in in a kind of response to bourgeois thinking right, right. like like that's that was the key question for for them and and for me and my my response at the time was i don't think this is solely a, a theoretical problem and i still don't but i've kind of changed my position on <laughs> on uh you know what i think should be done about it because we do i've seen what's happened when you when people start going from um where you, you where people just try to start with strategy. I mean, we can just like w the entirety of the millennial left in some ways. All right. The left that emerged, you know, after Obama has been obsessed with strategy and not even what the strategy is fucking for. <laughs> like, like, like a, a example, like we're always, you know, the DSA, this is like the yes. most obvious because we're fighting yes. for electeds and, and the, but it's like you don't even have a elected that, that you could protect from the current Democratic Party. So, of course, they're going to be inculcated into the DNC. Like that's basic game theory. That's not even Marxism. That's just like looking at what the most likely odds are going to be and who has money and power. Like, so what could you have done other than like these these things and what you see these things being these little maneuvers and what you see? And, and I'm going to give Platypus credit for this. Um, I remember in a discussion on a, a podcast that I don't know that it exists anymore. It was called Shit Platypus Says. And it was I had like Lori Rojas and Pam Nagalis and I believe maybe Reed Kane. I wasn't sure if he was on that episode or not. Um, and they were talking about the Ackerman plan. And they basically raised what I suspected the entire time too is from the harm reduction strategy that justifies having to do the Ackerman plan in the first place. Right? So you you're not going to risk like you know reactionary entrenchment um so you're going to try to empower the democrats so you can split off from them uh i think it was it may have been laurie who said i, I can't remember if it's laurie or pam but like by that logic they're never going to do it right because there's always going to be a justifiable reaction threat so there's no like there's no triggering conditions for this fucking split to happen within the, within the dsa and the democratic party and by the and you know and what I began thinking about is like not only is that true, but by the time that you could even begin to talk about it, your your quote electives are so inculcated into the Democratic Party in the first place that they're not going to be inclined to pull that anyway, which is something that we have historically seen before because the new left tried the same fucking thing when like. If you go back and read, I've, I've been reading a lot of Christopher Lash writing about the seventies. If you read what he writes about the seventies, the people who don't get, who don't just depoliticize a la Jerry Rubin and Alvin Hoffman basically try to do this entry as position first in the unions and then into the Democrats. And they just become Democrats. Like yeah. they're, they are the people who became the like functionaries for the Clinton administration. It's literally the same people. Like, I mean, yeah, uh, and, and 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 you know that that touches upon you know the the whole, and I, I have difficulty explaining this to uh, you know to to self self avowed Democrats sometimes. You know, this is the pivot point. <laughs> you know, with like Alinskyism and stuff, like getting codified as like you know uh, like the Democratic Party, like 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 handbook for like uh, uh, nonprofit, like NGO activism and the, 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 the sort of like um, uh, tenuous relationship that like exists there. Um, ab absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, you can kind of see it now with respect to uh, the, the, the DSA and like um, <sighs> the labor militancy that like they're attempting to engage so do you do you recall like when they tried to get um 
they tried to get the rank and file strategy um, adopted as like uh, an actual uh, leg of like the DSA's platform uh, several years mm -hmm. back. And then they initially succeeded. And then like, and I'm sign off sizing here. And, and so like, uh, I, I may miss a finer point or two here, uh, so, you know, if anybody wants to correct me, then feel free. But the, like the, the impression that I got of it is that like they got like the rank and file um, um, strategy, like, um, you know, adopted as like a major piece, like the DSA's platform. And then like a year later, they came back, you know, at the convention and then people had sort of separated into two camps. And the, the second camp was... Uh, they said like, hey, um, like we have nothing against unions um, the, or the DSA getting involved in unions. They should help. Uh, we're all for that. That's fine. But what we are concerned with is creating a sort of like uh, a DS, DSA to like union job like pipeline. Uh, mm -hmm. for like downwardly mobile millennials and like we don't want to like encourage people to like proletarianize themselves uh, like in institutionally as an organization like there are plenty of people in this organization and there were a lot of like I would imagine a lot of like sort of like people with like a white collar sensibility who were making this this argument within the DSA they're like you know there are people who are going to come through this organization young people who are going to be capable of like doing you know uh sort of like much more for themselves and having like a much better quality of life for themselves uh than than that and you know we don't want them funneled through um in in that way and so like what really ultimately kind of wound up happening was there was this uh, uh, this sort of compromise then um, in which uh, they they both agreed to to like uh, um, keep uh, as a piece of their platform that the DSA would you know help unions uh, wherever and whenever it could and that, that would be a really important part of what they do. Uh, but that they wouldn't like endorse like uh, the rank and file strategy for building socialist consciousness, like as it was laid out, like by Kim Moody. And then uh, what ultimately wound up happening, as we well know, is that all of that took a backseat to the DSA's electoralism. Um, because it's difficult to convince union bureaucrats to support the Democrats that you're running as socialists when you're constantly trying to remove those bureaucrats, you know, those bureaucrats, you know, to, to put them out of a job. And, and so to, to kind of come full circle here to bring it back around to to your point, I don't even think that there's particularly like clear um I don't think there's a particularly clear idea about like what the strategy is for with like any of this stuff. No, uh, I mean, I, like at was, all. But it's by not the time just you get post Bernie, it's, you just have the, the DSA, Derek. It's not just the DSA. It's my point is that there is a real fear of like a real deep seated like psychological fear of our own freedom, like as a condition of our humanity, like within the modern era, uh, that's just true. Uh, it's pervasive and, you know, uh, we're always going to have to deal with that. But, you know, the, the way in which I feel like it expresses itself, like with respect to the rest of the left is, you know, they're, they're, you know, they call themselves socialists, man. But at the end of the day, like time after time after time, you find that like when you follow like what they actually want, like to its logical conclusion, it's really just it's always about like uh, the, the fucking poor, the exploitation of uh, of, of uh, different groups of people and improving material conditions for people. It's just it's just social democracy, dude. Like at the end of the day, I swear to God, like under, under the veneer. I didn't think it's that, frankly. I mean, like one of the things that I agreed with Chris on, uh, Chris Cotron, for those of you who don't know, um, is I, I actually one time said like our reformism isn't even reformism. They're not trying to reform anything. They're basically asking for social goods and calling that socialism. And yes, it's made socialism more popular until recently when people, when I think a lot of people realize. Well, who doesn't want free shit? I wanted right. my student loans forgiven, just like I'm sure that you you did. I, I mean, would love for my student loans to be forgiven. Absolutely. Although, I would take a more structural fix. But the thing is, none of that deals with the primary problems. 
None of it, like, like, and I think people freak out when I say this. I'm like, what you're asking for our socialist program to be is what a mid-tier capitalist country can pull off in France. That's it. That's all you're asking for. Right. Like, like, and, and look, they're not even pulling it off, but like, it's, it's still like, you, you, you don't, the idea of workers power scares a lot of these people. The idea of freedom scares a lot of these people. The idea of, of equity with any responsibility. Okay. That last part scares a lot of these people. Why? Absolutely. The idea that if you don't work, you don't eat. (laughs) Right. It's like, like, yes, Marx does make provisions for like the disabled and stuff. He he does talk about that the Creek of the program, but but, but like what he we, does not do is give a shit about uh about the, the exploited dude. It was never really actually about exploitation. Hmm. Actually. Go ahead, talk about that. I mean, there's a reason why uh socialists felt that, that unions were you know, they were either neutral towards them or they, or they felt like they were conservative reactionary. Like they really don't actually care about the plight of, of, of the worker, dude. It's, it's like, it's, it's just a symptom of capital. The, the only thing that Marxism is about is getting beyond capitalism and nothing more. Okay. Um, So I'm going to, this is where I think we're going to have to have a, like a fundamental addition. What the, why, why have all that 300 something pages on uh, exploitation as a mechanism and capital, if that's the only goal, there's all kinds of ways to get beyond capital. You're right. There are multiple roots to the problem of capital. Um <sighs> Certainly we can say that like at the level of class relations, that like there's such, there's a much more like direct relationship at the level of production, um, you know, uh, when it comes to like the conditioning of like people's consciousness. Uh, and I, and I think that that's why it was written. Uh, not because, you know, there, there was like this, I don't think that any of this was wrought out of any kind of like particularly like acute sympathy for like well, I mean, it is interesting that, like, for example, um, uh, I don't think that poverty in and of itself is, like, Marxists are against poverty, but it's not because, like, how do I, how do I explain this? Because um, I think you and I actually agree well, on that. Well, not because it's evil, but because it's unnecessary. Right. It's like, and it it hampers the larger project. Like, if the larger project is human freedom, then poverty is a hamper to that. Like, that's the problem. And... Right. Like... There's a, but there's a, just a massive re- misrecognition here. Now, <laughs> more in the 21st century than ever, I would I would argue. And that's my point. With respect okay. to the law. And if that's what people really want, then they just, I wish that they would just be honest with themselves and with others and say, okay, if that's what you want, that's fine. I'm not going to say that you're wrong for wanting that. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with, with wanting any of that. Just leave Marx out of it. That's all that I'm saying. Well, yeah, I mean, th- here's the thing right now. Um the the re the re uh, the re intervening of Marxism in popular culture has ultimately ended up with Marx being even more than with the new left. I think a ventriloquist dummy. Like, um, oh yeah, yeah, used for anything and everything. Used for anything and everything. Anything you want to believe, you can find a Marx or Lenin to back you up. And yeah. like, there's there's it's um, like the fucking Bible, dude. <laughs> right, <laughs> like really not, yeah. Like pro free speech, anti free speech. I mean, you have to ignore Marx's life to make the anti free speech argument, but nonetheless, right? Um, uh, you can do it. Um, pro growth, anti growth. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that I understand what growth is under social under like socialist conditions because the way we measure growth now is in relation to capital. But whatever. Um, 
you can go all kinds of ways with it. I mean, there are some interesting questions that Platypus asks that I that I think a lot about that I'm not sure about. So one of the things that that like uh, Spencer Leonard has has brought up to me is like, how much do we view bourgeois society as having had to have been capital? I.e., is there a bourgeois society outside of the construct of capitalism? And that's an that's actually. Uh, most Marxists would say no, but I actually think that's a much harder question to answer than it initially seems. Like um, uh, the question about what the proper relationship to Bonapartism would be is actually not clear at all. Because it, you know, um, the proper relationship to liberalism is not clear at all, but for different reasons. And and for for one of the things I tell people is like, okay, um. Uh, you guys, you know, you read Chris Catron's article on Lenin's liberalism and Marxist liberalism, and you know, everyone agrees with it now. You have like Matt McManus and Ben Burgess will agree with it, as well as, uh, you know, and then you have your people who ultimately, like, you say the L word and it's used as a slur, right? But mm -hmm. like, it's pretty clear to me that no one understands what liberalism is either. So, like, because what Matt McManus means by Marxist liberalism and what Chris Catrone means by that are very, very different things, actually. Right. Like, I'm the kind of, you know, utilitarian progressivism that Matt McManus would, would attribute to that idea, um, which makes uh, Marxism just like liberalism plus like more justice or whatever, which is exactly what you're saying. The question of freedom is bracketed out. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, we can certainly focus like on the specifics of these things, because these are these are all particular ex expressions of, you know, what I'm about to touch on. But re really sort of the the abiding point here, I think, Derek, is is this. And, and I'm going to provide a, a sort of preface to it by saying that I actually I did an interview with uh, with Dan Labotz, um you know, who who is an, an old rank and file guy from the 1970s who continues to remain active today? He was um, uh, he was a member of, of of Solidarity before it voted to uh, uh, to disband and and become a part of the the DSA. Um, but in interviewing him, Spencer Leonard and, and I, and I'm paraphrasing, we we essentially asked him. Uh, whether or not the conversation, uh, well, for, first of all, we, we, we sort of made the assertion that like we are arguably farther away from socialism today than we have been at any other at any other time in history. And he agreed. He, yeah. Way, and agree well, 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 he he, he kind of hit the brakes on that and said, I don't necessarily agree with that. And then so we sort of pressed on and said, OK, well, that notwithstanding, we would like to know whether or not you feel that the conversation that is presently taking place is adequate to the task at hand. And he said, well, you know, and he did it in a sort of, you know, roundabout way. But he essentially said that, yes, he did. And to be honest with you, I didn't believe him. I didn't believe that he actually believes it. And if he doesn't, I don't know. I don't, you know, in other words, can't read I, a man's soul, but, <laughs> but the, you know, the, the point is, is, you know, I was, I wasn't sold, but the point is, is that, you know, I feel like there are a lot of people on the left out there that when you ask them one of the, these, one of these two questions, um, a have, has any progress been made, you know, within the last 50 years, if not more, and B are, um, are we any clearer about the reasons for us not having accomplished what we sought out to do than we were in, 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 in decades past. And, for a lot of people on on the left really hate those questions and will insist you know um you know to to the with the fiber of their being that the answer is yes to one uh or the other or both now, i don't think that that is something that you and i have in common but it's certainly something that that a large section of the left 
seems to have in, in common. And with respect to the sort of consistency of like Platypus's message over like the last 20 years is that we're still saying the same thing then than we, than we are now, is that progress has not been made and that we are not clear about the, the reasons for the failure of the left now than we were, you know, uh, 50 or or more years ago. And so, you know, whether or not you agree with that, they they are they are com they are completely sincere assertions. And I would hope that people will take them in good faith. Uh, not only that, I would hope that people would be so generous as to humor them and to, you know, even if at face value that turns them off to really mull on that. And if you find some things that are unsettling to you in doing so, then I, I think that we offer uh, so, some outlets which could be extremely constructive, not only in your own individual self, uh, self uh, development, but also within the, the uh, uh, the, the, the broader development of the left uh, trying to to work through its its own problems. You know, it's 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 not, you know, I think people get at this point, we're not trying to build a party like it's not something super ambitious in that way. It's like it's a very defined task. And, you know, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, all that's that actually is to do is to grapple. We're just asking people to grapple with it. With sincerity. That's it. I think one of the things that people like, it, it's actually kind of a, an important point to point out. Uh, Chris Catron has been involved with the Project for a Socialist Par Party in America, and he's made it very explicit that those two things are separate. The platypus yes. and any attempt to create a party has to be separate. Like right now at this point, they have to be separate from each other. Yeah, and um, I'm not so sure that like the the campaign for a socialist party really ever was actually anything, or at least anything much worth mentioning, because it was short circuited by Sanders so quickly, and so like there really wasn't an opportunity to do a whole lot there. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Like one of the things that I that I've been been pointing out to people is like, okay, let's say the DSA starts to hemorrhage numbers and it is. And let's say, what are the most likely organizations to pick that up? The PSL and the CPUSA, okay? To, you know, one former Marxite turned Marxist-Leninist, the other uh, Marxist-Leninist. But what are they going to do? Well, the PSL is going to do activist stuff, but still tied into the same stuff that the, the progressives generally do, just with more radical language. And a lot of the same stuff that anarchists do, even as they critique them, they're just going to be more, you know, Marxist Leninist y about it, to, yeah. for lack of a bit. You know. That also goes uh, for Freedom Road. Yeah, uh, that goes for Freedom Road too, uh, depending on which one you're talking about. And then, and then with the CPUSA, they've been doing the same popular front since the fucking 30s. They literally, like, no, they don't endorse <laughs> Democrats, but they, they don't do, like, they'll chastise you for any other electoral option. So, um, so again, have you by leaving the DSA for those two organizations, have you have you changed anything about the current orientation? Only if you were to go into battle in those organizations, but that's gonna be a very hard uh road to hoe, particularly with someone like the CPUSA, because CPUSA, uh I mean, just in buildings holdings, they have money. Like not even from like they've just been around so long. I know. Like like so like, you're, like very lucrative pieces of property too that were bought right. they were much much cheaper and then yeah, and then I mean, they like have like their twenties <laughs> yeah and there's like a staff of like four people in there <laughs> right I mean so it's like when I tell people this like well like so you know most of your options right now there was a time Third where I, yeah where I thought maybe going into the, like the SP USA. May have been worth it, but that seems to have passed its prime, um, you know. And and I'll give Platypus credit for this. Um, even after I left, they never actually said they knew what the answer to that was. Like that that has been clear. If you listen to them, they're not trying to bait and switch you. Um, 
which I will give them credit for. This was one of my things a little bit with Ben is like, yeah, sometimes I find Chris Catron's rhetoric to be vague. I mean, I just don't speak that way. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, I have not had him claim an answer to something that he didn't have an answer for. And particularly when you get a, when you would get him off of polemic mode and just like have a long interview with him. I did a three hour interview with him once. Like it's, it's just, it's not the case that like they're trying to funnel people into Republicans or anything like that. There's, there's just no, that, that doesn't seem to be what's going on. There have well, been individuals who have case, gone that way. Yeah. Right? If, it, if that is the case, it's so convoluted as to not even be all that effective. <laughs> right. It's just it's like, not. it doesn't have to happen. I mean, one thing I will say, you know, one of my confusions about platypus in, in some ways, and you know, uh, and I've talked to Spencer about this a little bit privately is like, look, I've known, you know, many people in and out of that organization over the years. And uh, uh, what we all say it is, is always different, even though the fundamental prepositions about platypus has been remarkably consistent for 20 years. So I, I'm not saying that's a that's I'm not even saying that's a bad thing. It's, a, it's just an interesting observation that what we think, even within the organization what people take away from what those propositions, which are remarkably steady, actually mean. Mm, yeah, true. It's actually very varied and they're allowed. So they're not trying to censor people for having like different interpretations, even though occasionally they're like, well, that's wrong. Well, I'm like, okay, it's wrong. Uh, so let's clarify. What do you mean? And, and so that's why, that's why I have a particular, Stance. I haven't always been that way. There have been times, I'll admit, I have been more bitter towards the organization. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we're uh, not always the most, you know, the most easy, easy organization to get along with. So, you know, I, I realize there's, I realize there's that. that. I realize uh, that. there there are personalities on your, uh, but you know, um, in there was also there have been organizations that I've been involved with where things have been much more. Um, you know what? You know what? Platypus gets compared to the most was spite from the Revolutionary Communist Party of Great Britain. Um, and that comparison doesn't seem to me fair because, like, it's not like Chris Catron's ever been on like a um a conservative action conference. Like that has not happened. Oh, are you talking about? Uh, hold on, is is no? I'm thinking of the CPGB. I don't. I don't. I don't know the the Revolutionary Communist Party of. Uh, th- that's that's uh that's the people who produce spike magazine oh oh yeah 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 people do make that reference out of spite um but right. then again you know to 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 one of your previous points like stuff like that like doesn't stay consistent for 20 years you know like it collapses and then becomes like something else right i mean you know most of the pe- not all i don't want to i don't want to defame the revolutionary Communist party or spike because there are some people i know who are uh, tangentially tied to that, who are still who are still communists, but most of the people tied to that no longer even remotely identify as Marxist, communist, leftist, or anything like right. that. Like, um, so it's you know it has its own sketchy origins, and and trust me, if there's a lot of history of like sketch platypus money, somebody some muckraker would have brought it up <laughs> because uh, uh, trust me, dude, we don't have any fucking money. <laughs> Um, uh, no, uh, so, I mean, I just, you know, this is a weird thing. Cause I know that people, people know that I have, you know, ambivalence, but actually I, I will also admit that, um, since in the last two years, I've probably had more exchanges with platypus members than I've had any time since 2013, 2014. And most of those exchanges have been at least interesting, if not positive. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's which is ebb and flow. Yeah, they ebb and flow. People don't understand that. You know, I think you know I am worried about right deviationism probably a lot more. But I actually do think the question of freedom is important. Um, and here's the other thing I'll say: if people mm-hmm. want to get that, if, want to give that up on the left, fine. But admit you're doing it. Like, yeah, 
like it meant the project's different that you don't believe in that project anymore right why like, well just say it because and I, I can live with that. do that from time to time too like i will talk to like old new leftists and they were just like yeah you know and and they they will you know finally say they're all right i'm just gonna be real with you like i don't think that's ever fucking coming back and you know i'm just i'm just gonna vote progressive you know i'm sorry and i'm like all right that's fine that's all you had to say you know like right. i'm not gonna i'm not gonna shit on you for that you know if that's what you want to do then then by all means but um you know i guess what i would say is is this <sighs> sort of like my abiding point or the thing that I would sort of want people to, to take away about, um, you know, the, the organization is what did, what did you say earlier? Um, you know, what I would want people to take away from, from the organization is the point that every is is essentially that like an independent socialist party is necessary like almost everyone can agree with that almost everyone can agree with that and what i feel like is even if everyone doesn't agree with it what is at least super plausible to say the super plausible argument to make is that why does every attempt to do that now in recent history become almost immediately scuttled and just become a dead end? Like there is a real sense of a historical impasse here. Like yeah. something, something that like try as we might, like with all of like our collective, like, like, intellectual power uh and like organizational capability like that we cannot like break out of that uh yeah, it, no it, economic crisis seems to do it either yeah like, yeah like i was just talking to stefan hamill who's a guy i really respect and really enjoy talking to but he's just like well that you know i'm such an economic determinist that i just think the economic crisis is going to just fit is going to like make it obvious and i'm like no <laughs> that's never happened actually know, right? <laughs> like like uh like you know my, my my thing with crisis theory is not that i disagree about capitalist crisis or even that maybe there'll be a final one is that it doesn't necessitate anything like no. all, right, all, um, it, all that it necessitates is the 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 uh the existential need for capital to, to reconfigure itself that's it Yeah. And uh, it seems to keep on doing it. And so whenever someone's predicting a final crisis, I'm just like, yeah, we just keep a new instantiation of capitalism. Um, uh, I mean, it seems to be much more mutational than feudalism, whatever that was. <laughs> so, um, so, that, so that being said, you know, with respect to everything that we've talked about, the banking crisis and like, what does it mean for the left right now? You know, I am I'm going to be perfectly honest with you and say, I don't know. I don't know that it means anything. I mean, I haven't really seen what like the I, mean, I don't even know that we know what it's going to mean. Like if we have a, a, a recession with with fucking high employment, I don't like, <laughs> like, like, yeah. like I'm just I'm like saying. These are uncharted economic conditions. I don't always, know what that is. I mean, they're uncharted, like political conditions too, man. Like we are hurling headlong into like post neoliberalism. Like you know, the 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 previous interconnectedness of the world is unraveling, and everyone's clamoring to figure out you know what the new interconnectedness will be. And then, of course, you know, the left is a huge a huge. Uh, a, part of that and you know and, and left and, academia on that actually just to like put that in perspective also tends to be about a half a generation too late so i was i was we i would i used to make this joke with uh um with ross wolf back when we were both in platypus that like oh look we have another book about fordism we're talking about fordism in 2012 <laughs> oh, oh and like everything's neoliberalism now and well, yeah, that, that's it's. I was gonna say, um, like neoliberalism's probably been over since since 
the since the recession. Right. Like, you know, the, the interesting thing about that is is that like capitalism, like 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 on its own, like it it doesn't have anything to like to pull from from within itself to reconfigure itself like in decades past like it's it's like relied on like it, i don't know am i explaining this coherently it's like like the capitalism has needed the left to reconfigure itself in in generations past and like now in the absence of the left, like with continued crisis, then we're in sort of like uncharted territory there too, because it's like, you know, what the, then what is going to provide then the substance by which like the left or the, the, the capitalism is going to continue to reconfigure itself? I have no fucking idea. No, me neither. I mean, yeah. Um... Not a lot of great options here, man. Uh, so I I know it, that it's it's a pretty dismal time to be a leftist, but uh, I will say this: you know, with respect to everything that we've talked today, and you know, the crisis and the collapse of banks and all that stuff. That being said, everybody still has got to get up, and you've got to go to your job, and uh, like life goes on, man. And like that is something also that that is bothersome to me about like the left too is or like a lot of people on on the left is like at the at the end of the day this isn't this not only should this not it, it it will not really actually change anything about the way that you live your life you've still got to be a functional member of society you've still got to uh like no, you, you, you still you still to be uh, well you don't have to be but you should be and Rest. and you you know you've still got to in, invest uh in in uh, in order to retire and that includes in the military industrial complex and like you know you've still got to do all this shit uh, what i'm saying is is that like in spite of the doom and gloom of like you know um the the, the continued uh, uh like the perennial crises of 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 capitalism and like the dismal state of the left you still have to be a good bourgeois subject mm -hmm. <laughs> you know um you still and have most, to maintain a, a sense of uh you know a, a decent sense of like personal self-discipline with 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 all of that so well yes but uh um i mean i'm not gonna get off into because i want to start sounding like a yeah, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start lecturing people if I don't stop. <laughs> like, um, uh, you know, talking about um, not only is victimization not a reason not to to be self disciplined, but it's actually, if you took it seriously, means that you have absolutely more reason to be self disciplined. Um, yes. Uh, but you know, that's that's uh, that's that's my general ethos. Yeah. Um, so, one thing so I would. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, so next week on Matt and Derek tell you how to live your life. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I would say, though, I mean, people may be surprised at some of the, the stuff we say here. Uh, it is a dismal time to be a leftist, but why? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm actually serious. That question should actually sit with some people's head. Why did the, you got, you, you know, you fought, you guys fought for Bernie. Bernie told you to support support biden to beat trump you even got some of the concessions to social democracy from both trump and and biden at first during covid now they're all going away and they're not going to maintain it whatever but you got it for a little while why is it so dismal like that's actually a pretty big question to ask i think like, i have a pretty pretty straightforward answer to that i mean of course you know unpacking it would would take much more but like you know my straightforward answer to that is that people are disappointed to find that, that casting off all of the historical baggage of the the failure of the left in the 20th century proved much more difficult than many of us ever expected it to be Right. Well, I, a lot of people's responses just to pretend that that, that did. I mean, literally, it, in some it, 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 it did never it. happened. Yeah. Like, like, like people running around like you can like reinvent, um, you know, the common turn, uh, stall, you know, uh, Marxist Leninism under Stalin are, um, are 
even like Neo Kowskianism, like set the second international. I'm just like, no, you, you like you don't live under those conditions. Like you, yeah, you can learn from it. It's important to know it. It's like, you know, anyone from, from, from me or anyone in platypus and uh, would tell you that it's important to understand these things, but like, you can't, recapitulate them one to one it's not going to happen it won't look that way yeah and you know? similarly there's there's the uh, um there there's the inclination to uh admit that it happened but then to deny that you now then have anything to do with it at all you know well yeah that's the which, other which, response which, yes. which yeah the other response which is you know kind of kind of to do with the whole idea of like democratic socialism as a qualifier as if to say oh well like i'm not that kind of socialist yeah but you you still have to own what happened right yes um actually interesting this even goes back to like perry and I, this is what i was discussing with Stephen hamill the other day which will come out after this because i'm going to put this up pretty quickly um but uh, it even goes into like the concept of like Western Marxism versus Eastern Marxism, which is, you know, yes, a lot of people use now as a disparagement. But when Perry Anderson came up with the term, it was like, well, you know, there's this dissident thinking that's happening in Marxism because it doesn't have any relationship to the state. And and so we can cut it off from any responsibility for what's going on in the Soviet Union or in China or even the problems of the Sino-Soviet split uh, by positing like this dissident pure remnant form um in the quote west unquote and and while there's some truth that, that there was a separation there but like they're in continuity to each other particularly in a figure like lukash like lukash literally you know was a functionary so it's uh you know in the in the post hungarian revolution government i mean it's it's important to understand all that, I think. And it's not dealt with enough. And people try to um, limit any accountability or any standing. They're always trying to separate themselves and differentiate themselves from it. Um, and well, I mean, it, it doesn't it's, work. It's, it's, it's related to, you know, the, the disintegration of, like, Marxism into various Marxisms, like, over the course of, like... The 20th century, but then also like the sort of compartmentalizations of all of the things that, you know, would have formerly been understood to be like integrated into like under one roof in the political party and mediated that way, uh, then mm -hmm. then separated out, um, you know, into its own like constituent parts, um, you know, uh, uh, across like the 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 20th century like i i see it more or less is like um in an extension or a symptom of that mm, that's a good point well on that note thank you so much um matt um these are uh two related and very important conversations although they're probably going to strike people as pretty different in tone when they listen to this. yeah perhaps <laughs> um but uh, i also you know i as much as I would love to be a, a good grossman, I and just hope that yeah, you know, this is the crisis. This is the one. And I, well, the, I, I've been burnt too many is, times. Yeah, the <laughs> you know, the Fed is going to have to choose between uh, a a fiscal crisis and an economic crisis. I mean, it's going to have to choose between. Uh, continuing to uh, raise interest rates in order to, to fight inflation at the risk mm -hmm. of like uh, the systemic instability of banks, or it's going to have to, to uh, get get gun shy um, because of the instability of banks and to uh, lower rates before the uh, the, the job of uh, tamping inflation is is done. And um, you know. I, I guess what I would say to that is that my guess is that they're probably going to continue to raise uh, rates despite what may happen with the banks because the threat of the effect of uh, long-term elevated inflation on the economy is greater. Uh, we're going to find out pretty soon whether or not I'm right about that. So if I'm, yeah. if I'm, 
if I'm right, I'll come back and gloat. And if I'm wrong, then I'll come back and and, and you can give me a bunch of shit. <laughs> We're recording this on th- on uh, uh, March 19th. We're probably going to release it on March 20th, but just so because the date stamps really matter for this, and given how much has happened in just this last week. Yeah, uh, but I, I I think you're right, and my my evidence is the European Central Bank still raised rates. Like, so we got a hint where they're thinking. Yeah. So far, the U.S. Fed and the European Central Bank have been kind of in lockstep on this. Yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, keep an eye out next week. I think I think that's yeah, I think it's the um, the 22nd is uh, the Federal Open Market Commission um, meeting. So, you know, right after you release this, we're either going to look really smart or really stupid. Stupid. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. All right. Well. All right. Well, take care, man. It was a pleasure as always. Bye. Pleasure talking to you. Bye-bye.